Welcome everyone. My name is Samantha Oakley from ALA's Public Programs Office. I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar, Taking a Walk with the Library, Story Walk, Walking, Book Clubs, and more. Before we start, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office with support from the ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. To learn more about the Cultural Communities Fund or make a contribution, visit ala.org ccf. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars just like this one. A couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenters have microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. To send a chat message, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click chat. Uh, please note that the chat defaults to sending to only presenters today. Um, so to send to everyone, please be sure to select to all panelists and attendees from the drop down box next to two in that window. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A window to communicate with ALA staff. To send a message through the Q&A feature, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on Q&A. Please do not put technical questions in the chat window as they could be missed if that window is very busy. We will respond to your technical questions as quickly as possible. Please note that this session will be recorded, so if you would like to review any information, you may do so via the archived version that we will send out within 48 hours. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for this afternoon, Laura Lentz, Noah Lenstra, Emily Nanny, and Danielle Henson. Noah is an assistant professor of library and information science at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro where he directs Let's Move in Libraries. He is the author of Healthy Living at the Library and received a three-year grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to study how small and rural public libraries address health and wellness through public programs. He is a member of the Public Library Association's Promoting Healthy Communities Advisory Group and blogs for ALA's Public Programs Office. Joining Noah today is Emily Nanny. Emily has worked in Charlotte Mecklenburg Library for 20 years. Since October 2018, she has been the education leader providing strategic oversight for programming and educational partnerships. Emily previously held positions in library services, including coordinator, manager, and librarian. She was a 2018 Randolph Caldecott Selection Committee uh, member a 2015 PLA Leadership Academy member, a team lead for the ALSC Institute and project coordinator for the LSTA Story Walk Grant in 2018. Presenting with Emily and Noah is Danielle Henson. Danielle is the Community Collaboration Coordinator at Gail Borden Public Library District in Elgin, Illinois. Her in her position, Danielle serves to connect the community and library as they rise to fulfill their mission of the library being a place where imagination and transformation flourish, fueled by the power of community. Danielle is the co-chair of Activate El Elgin, a community wellness coalition, and chair of the Activate uh, Elgin annual district-wide free wellness programs, March into Health. Uh, and with that, I'm pleased to turn the mic over to Noah. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Lenstra, and as part of my job as an assistant professor of library and information science, I started in 2016 Let's Move in Libraries, a research based initiative to foster healthy practices through public libraries. And I'm thrilled to be here today with you all. Next slide, please. So here's a quick rundown of our agenda. Um, I'll start by briefly discussing four ways I found public librarians combine programming and walking. Emily will then share her story of story walk programming. Danielle will then share her stories of libraries in motion. And I'll wrap up with some closing thoughts, identifying key factors any librarian considering this type of programming should keep in mind. <clears throat> we'll end with a question and answer period. We'll do, we'll do our best to address all your questions during the Q&A, but if we run out of time, please do feel free to reach out to us. We're passionate about this topic and we wanna do whatever we can to help you embrace walking at your library. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna start with the four ways programming and walking combine. 
based on research I've been doing for the past three years. If you'd like to dig deeper into this topic, you can take a look at this open source article I published with one of my graduate students earlier this year, which is available in the handout um, uh, attached to the, the website for the webinar today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first way librarians combine walking and programming is by connecting stories and walking. Here is a map of public libraries across North America that told me in a spring 2017 survey that they had done outdoor story walk programming. You'll see that this programming had, even a few years ago, spread all over the continent. A little less common, but becoming more common as walking book clubs for adults and older readers. Uh, next slide, please. The second thing librarians do to combine walking and programming is by focusing on cultural heritage. This can include everything from local history walks to ghost tours, cemetery walks, and even walks that highlight local art or sculpture, as the Iowa City Public Library did a few months ago. Uh, next slide, please. The third way walking and programming come together occurs when librarians support existing walking initiatives. A great example of this is teaming up with local Walk with the Dock chapters. The Denver Public Library has supported this national initiative for years by co-hosting Walk with the Dock programs that begin and end at, at branches of the library. Take a look at the Walk with the Dock website to find a chapter near you. And if one doesn't exist, think about starting one. Libraries also participate in local step and pedometer challenges, as well as so much more. Uh, next slide, please. And so the fourth and final way I've seen programming and walking come together occurs when libraries focus on supporting safe routes to and from libraries. Now this is not only for walking, but also for people on bicycles, wheelchairs, public transportation, basically anyone coming to your library, not in a car or truck. In California, the Palo Alto Public Library developed this map to help people identify safe routes for walking and rolling to the city's libraries. Uh, next slide, please. And in St. Louis, the library took it a step further and teamed up with the local Human Services Office to offer a walkability of your neighborhood program. Participants engaged in a one-mile guided walk focused on assessing how safe it feels to walk in the community. So you can do walkability assessments at your library, map safe routes to and from your library, and when you do this work, you can take advantage of resources like our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Connecting Safe Routes and Destinations initiative which explicitly includes public libraries as destinations that should be accessible via walking, bicycle, wheelchair, and public transit. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick recap before I turn things over to Emily and Danielle. Here are four ways you can connect programming and walking at your library. Connect stories and walking through a story walk. Connect cultural heritage and walking through a ghost tour of downtown. Support walking initiatives that already exist, like Walk with the Dock, or support safe routes to and from your libraries. And again, you can learn more in this article. And now I'm going to turn things over to Emily Nanny, who will go deeper into the first strategy, focusing on her library's great story walk initiative. Uh, go ahead. Yep, thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily Nanny. Um, I'm the education leader for Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. And at the top of the slide, you'll see the logo that our marketing and communication department created for story walks in our community. Next slide, please. Um, to let you know a little bit about the community we serve, Charlotte Mecklenburg Library is in the state of North Carolina in the largest county. Um, over 368,000 people are active library card holders, meaning they've used their account within the past two years. We offered over 29,000 programs in fiscal year 2019, and we have 20 library locations. You'll see on the bottom left of your screen is our main library, which is soon to be re renovated in a couple of years. And on the right is Imagine On, our flagship building for you. Next slide, please. 
So just to give you a little background information, um, if you're not familiar, story walks are opportunities for children and families or really anyone to enjoy two great things, reading and outdoor spaces at the same time. A story walk is literally taking apart a picture book, placing each laminated page in a weatherproof protected frame and placing those frames in an outdoor space so that children and families can enjoy books in an outdoor setting. Next slide, please. Um, so some things as we were considering um, the possibility of having story walks um, in our library included in the spring of 2017, we were considering applying for an LSTA grant from our state library. Uh, but we wanted to do some research and consider a few things. Um, we by no means were the first person to ever do a story walk. Um, story walks were created first by Ann Ferguson of Montpelier, Vermont, and developed with the help of Rachel Senegal from Kellogg Hubbard Library. Um, and there were even story walks throughout our state in some parts. Um, but we wanted to find a unique um, aspect of applying to have them in Mecklenburg County. Um, we have a partnership with Reed Charlotte, whose initiative working with us and through, uh, with, throughout the whole county is to promote children reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Um, currently we're at 39% and by 2025, the goal is for 80% of children to be on grade level. So we wanted to incorporate active reading techniques um, into our story walks, which is asking questions, building vocabulary, and connecting to the child's world. Um, we also wanted to strategically place our story walks in inner city parks where we have book deserts, meaning families have fewer access to books in those areas, less books in the home, and maybe not as close to public libraries. We had tried some temporary story walks um, at our Steel Creek Library location. There's an outdoor garden and the children's librarian there had created um, some story walks to put out after story time, just using some like garage sale signs with stakes. Um, and they were outside a couple of hours after story time each week. Those were very popular. She shared that at a children's services meeting um, and we created kits of laminated um, pages to pass around to library locations to use in the building. But this was the first time ever we had considered permanent story walks. So we knew it was a large commitment. When talking to our facilities maintenance department, we learned that we would not be able to actually um, install the posts and frames. So we reached out to Mecklenburg County Parks and Recreation Department um, we showed them pictures of posts and frames from, we've been working with barking dog exhibits. Um, we said that we wanted 20 posts and frames in three inner city parks um, and kind of worked out some starting details with them and made sure that they were on board. Um, there are several places, barking dogs exhibits was um, the vendor that we used. They happened to have been at ALA that same summer that we were doing our research. Um, and so we're excited to work with them if we received funding. Next slide, please. Um, so when thinking about our launch events, um, we decided that we wanted to strategically place our posts and frames for story walks um, in parks that elementary schools actually use the park as their playground area. Um, so three, those original three parks, we did just that, working with Parks and Rec. Um, halfway through um, receiving funding and getting the grant, we realized that we would have additional funding available. Um, we did reach out back to Mecklenburg County Parks and Recreation, but they wanted to make sure that we can ma maintain the three-story walks, which was 60 posts and frames. So we reached out to the nearby towns. Um, Pineville Lake Park and Squirrel Lake Park, Squirrel Lake Park and Matthews and Pineville Lake Park, of course, in Pineville, and they jumped right on board um, and they actually determined which parks they wanted. So those are um, further out, not in the middle of the city, but still reaching um, children and families. Um, we also offered um, 
ribbon cuttings for each of the parks that first year and celebrations we've gone back. So we've done actually 10 events um, in a little over two years. Next slide, please. Um, so some things that we wanted to think about in our kickoffs and celebrations is we involve leadership in this process every step of the way and we wanted leadership to be there. Um, our CEO, our library director, um, associate directors um, to share information. We did a short um, kickoff speech for the children and families in attendance. Um, and we also have started including um, authors who have their stories featured in our story walks um, as we progress. So in the picture at the bottom of this slide, you'll see Tony DiTerlizzi, um, who was part of our community read in March this year. His book, Love, was featured at one of our parks. Um, we also worked with um, Tony DiTerlizzi, who was in Charlotte um, this fall for an exhibit at the Mint Museum. So we've started doing that as well. Um, in our um, celebrations and kickoffs, we have lots of exciting stations in addition to the story walk. We have a story time station, we have sensory and literacy stations, movement and big game activities, art and paint. You'll see an example of the art behind the children there on the screen and a big heart that they're painting. We have book giveaways, stickers related to story walk, chalks and bubbles. Um, so we really try to make it a huge event in addition to the story walk being open all the time, but we have special celebrations where we're looking for um, to capture lots of people in attendance. Next slide, please. So we have had some challenges, even though um, we have loved having story walks and they've been such a big um, thing for our system and exciting, you really want to consider that having story walks um, is a long term initiative. Um, so we had to consider past um, the grant, how were we going to fund um, if we needed extra posts and frames or plexiglass or extra books. Um, so we had to think about all of those things. When Parks and Rec originally um, installed the frames, um, they installed them upside down and the drainage holes were at the top of the frame instead of the bottom and that created excess water. Um, and then during the winter months, it created ice in there and it made it hard to remove those um, storyboards. So you wanna make sure that they're installed correctly. Um, plexiglass comes in different thicknesses. So I worked directly with Barking Dog exhibits to make sure that we could get the thinner plexi. Um, that was important. We have had at one of our parks um, some vandalism to the posts and frames. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that Park and Rec could still work with us to change out the posts and frames. That was very unusual, but we are having some vandalism issues at one of our locations. Um, it does quite, cost quite a bit to laminate the storyboards. Um, we use really thick laminate, 10 millimeters, which lasts really well. Um, but it costs about $300 for us to do 20. So luckily we're able to use those storyboards a couple of times, which is about six months. You also want to think about how often you need to change out the stories. Um, we originally said we were going to change them out every four to six weeks in each of our five parks. Um, we've now switched to changing them out every quarter because it does take a while to develop the questions, take the books apart, get them laminated, and add all those um, other things that we have for each panel. So you want to kind of consider all of those things when you're thinking about um, getting before you get those permanent story walks. Next slide, please. Um, assessments is, are also really important and you have to think about assessments a little differently with story walks because wherever a story walk is, um, you can't be there all the time if it's outside. So we of course can't be at all five of our parks 24 hours a day. So in our grant, we actually said that we were gonna have a certain number of ribbon cuttings and celebrations, and we hope to have a certain number of people present at those celebrations and ribbon cuttings. So 
We were able to count the number of attendance. As I said, we were strategic where we put those story walks so that we could have a guaranteed audience of inviting um, preschools and elementary schools right within walking distance. We do have a survey on the last um, page of our story walk with a bit.ly link and some families do complete that. We don't get lots of those, but the more often we change the stories, the more surveys we get. We continue to receive requests um, for customers throughout the county for additional story walks. So we know that they're popular and they're wanted. Um, we've included visiting a story walk as part of our summer learning program. In a few slides, you'll see an example of some billboards that we were able to um, pay for to promote when we have funding for the story walks. Our marketing and communication department works hard to post things on Facebook. They've created a hashtag, and we also have a library web page that um, refers specifically to the story walks in our system. Next slide, please. So we do have several partners. Um, I've mentioned Read Charlotte. Um, we work with them on active reading, and they are um, definitely one of our partners because we wanted to be able to use that initiative and active reading questions in our story walk. Mecklenburg County Parks and Recreation, um, they help us, um, they install the posts and frames. If I need to go back to them for the park that's um, had some posts and frames damage, I can reach back out to them. Um, so they have been wonderful. They actually even ended up donating their time that they do this. They said that's part of their job as opposed to charging us. So that has been very helpful. And then we reached out to the two towns, Pineville and Matthews have been great to post on social media when we change stories or have events. Um, Matthews, we approached them late in the fiscal year and they had extra funding to be able to install posts and frames for us. Um, so it's really helpful if you can have partners to help with some of that heavy lifting and promotion. Next slide, please. Um, I would also considering have a team of staff that can help you. Story walks is something that you definitely want to involve a group, whether it's creating the storyboards, which takes quite a bit of time, changing out those storyboards throughout the year, um, maintaining supplies you need like poster boards, books, um, going to get stories laminated, and of course those large program programs that you might plan for. Um, you want to involve staff in um, having ideas um, related to the books that you're using. Next slide, please. Um, promotion is also so important with story walks. Um, as I mentioned, when we had um, funding the first year for the grant, we purchased lots and lots of stickers um, that, again, our marketing communication team was great to use that logo that you saw on the first slide to create a little sticker that says, I'm a story walker, Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. So we always make sure that the children and families have um, those stickers to, to share with their parents when they go home, um, if they were at school that day, that they participated in a story walk. We have rack cards that list all of our parks um, and define what a story walk is and have the address of our parks. In the bottom of the slide, you'll see an example of a billboard that we had. Um, we had a few billboards strategically placed near parks to promote story walks. Um, and also, our city is able to work with marketing communication to tell us how many people on a daily basis drive by that highway or the street that has the story walk. That doesn't mean that everybody reads the billboard, but we have an idea and another assessment way to say how many people have had the potential to hear about story walks. Our partners promote on social media, as do we, and we do surveys. So in the top of that slide, you see an example of a board that we use at the end of a story to have people um, post their pictures using the hashtag and a reminder about completing the survey. Next slide, please. Um, so, if you'd like, after the presentation today or in the future, you can um, follow the bit.ly links to see photos from lots of our events that we've had. Um, as I said, we've been doing a lot since 2017 with Story Walks and glad to share some of our examples. 
And we do events, whether it's in the winter, you see some of our staff there in the spring in their heavy coats or in the summer. And the more and more as we move forward with story walks in our system, we're trying to incorporate story walks into large scale initiatives. So whether it's STEAM month next year with the election happening, we may have books around um, voting and leadership and servant leadership that will include for children. So we try to think about what annual large events are happening and include story walks if it's relative. Now I'd like to pass the mic on to Danielle. Inspiring story walk, Emily. Thanks for sharing. Partners are definitely uh, powerful when we're doing large projects. I'm Danielle Henson from Gail Borden, an active and engaged library district that's on the move in our community. Let's jump in. Next slide. I want to thank Let's Move in Libraries and Pro Programming Librarian for giving us uh, a chance to share our path of incorporating walking and movement into library programs and events in Elgin, Illinois. We're 45 miles west of Chicago and serve over 144,000 residents with three branches, a bookmobile, and a book bike. Next slide. The Walking Book Club stepped off in 2009 with a suggestion from our overly active partners at the Elgin Parks and Recreation to match book clubs with physical activity. We rose to the challenge and designed a weekly walking book club to give avid walkers a broader range of literary options and avid readers a dedicated day for physical activity. We decided the physical benefits of walking in a normal monthly book club would be limited. So we broke up the reading into four segments discussing one section each week after the walk. Our collaboration got a workout when we designed the book club to utilize the rec center's indoor walking track each Wednesday night. We began with 14 to 18 members. We had a really good turnout and had to invest in two staff members each week for a year and a half, two years, splitting up the walking book club into two walking and discussion groups. So everybody would read a different, uh, the two groups would read different books so that we had enough books. Over time, the group became an ideal eight to 12 attendees per session requiring only one staff leader. And then as the group evolved, the staff leaders now attend only the final book discussion each month. So you have to kind of work with your staffing and uh, other things as your book club evolves. That gives our Walking Book Club original members leadership roles on the track. And you look at staffing and creative use of volunteers, you may able, be able to create a walking book club that fits your community, your budget, and strategic plan. Next slide, please. We've used routes around town in the spring, summer, and fall, and then the indoor track for inclement weather, um, during the winter especially. We have bike and walking paths along the river and lit streets downtown as options for walking. So I suggest you research your paths, your well-lit streets, universities, recreational centers, or hospital walking tracks, maybe malls in your area. When you reach out, you may get some resistance if they have never stepped out on a partnership like this before. Um, often partners with indoor tracks actually want to attract new people. So um, you know, it, it may be a, a good conversation for you to have to get people in their doors. And if you don't have an indoor resource, um, maybe an outdoor seasonal walking book club might work for you. So think about that. Next slide, please. Some things we learned on our walking book club trek, always have emergency contacts for walkers, let people ease into their own pace in smaller groups. They don't have to keep up with the faster group, um, but they should not walk alone. So pairing up people might be a good idea for people who are slower. Staffing and volunteer changes will happen. So be prepared to be flexible and allow walkers to help facilitate the walk and discussions as they're able. Have an agreeable plan for the group to communicate and add directions for emergency cancellations, weather events. Arrange spaces in buildings or outdoors for a cool down talk each week. So again, 45 minute walk, 45 minute uh, cool down talk. Staff leading the final discussion is essential 
to check in and add valuable insight, research on topics in the book. It keeps the group from um, uh, devolving into just a social group. And so, you know, getting, getting people back on track and stepping out on the right foot. Next slide, please. Thanks, Samantha. At Gail Borden, librarians select the annual book list, consult with paraprofessionals who lead the Walking Book Club, and advise on all adjustments for the book club as it's evolved. Paraprofessionals create reading breakdowns and access interlibrary loans if needed, maybe extra copies for staff so that that frees up books for our walkers. The marketing team creates the bookmarks, logos, t-shirt art, advertising. Creating a walking book club brand has been exciting for many of the members over the years because they've walked and ran in local marathons together with their shirts. And we have some fun pictures of that somewhere floating. Next slide, please. Here's the official walking book club shirt uh, and some of the original members. Attendance numbers, overall literacy and health benefits can be tracked by surveying. You can ask your Walking Book Club members, what the benefits have been over time. You'll find many participants report positive health and emotional bonds, as well as a deeper literary engagement with the books. You can also discover opportunities to share with local and national publications who are interested in different ways that libraries do book clubs, quote unquote. So that's fun. Next slide, please. Obviously, when we walk at different paces and you have a large group, it's best to wait to talk about the, book, about the book, so your conversations on the track or outside are not about the book. We learned we can't walk uh, while we, or we can't talk while we walk, or at least uh, not about the book. Here, um, Beth shares a little bit about how she reads Walking Book Club books a little more carefully and marks special things she likes to share with the group. She researches music and topics introduced in the books that she does not do with her other leisure reading. Because we break the book into four segments, people share a different way and they often guess about the next section of the book. So that's kind of a fun, fun thing. This brings a deeper relationship then to the material. Next slide, please. Thank you. Many members report they were not already walkers, or at least not consistent walkers, and some members report that they were not avid readers before joining. Creating a space for reading, activity, and social connection is in line with 21st century literacies and invites community members with little free time to connect many of our physical, social, and literacy needs in one program. So this is a little bit about what Valerie has offered. Next slide, please. In 2011, we ran with another idea, Team Read, 7K Run and 1K Family Fun Walk. This is the Gail Borden uh, Team Read team. So, well, some of them at least. Next slide, please. This is a massive undertaking, Join, joining the love of reading with running and walking, then engaged over 250 uh, Elgin area movers and shakers. Partner powered to take it to the paths and the streets of Elgin. So um, it is a big endeavor, but it's not impossible. And it was a lot of fun. Next slide, please. There are many steps to create an official marathon, or there are ways to make it a fun run and not officially timed. And then there are ways to have both. So we suggest you determine what your goal is, how much you and your partners will invest, and who you want to attract. So serious runners want a certified and timed event. You'll need to connect with running officials in your area and other marathon event organizers for expert direction. Of course, libraries can recommend an appropriate book list for their runners, but we need their expert help in developing a well-planned and a safe run. Next slide, please. Our run was hosted by our foundation and supported by staff and volunteers and over 30 community partners. We researched marathons, partnered with universities, high school track teams, businesses, Activate Elgin, which is a wellness coalition, and the city of Elgin who hosts the annual Foxtrot. So it's a 10K, 5K run, and then uh, a one mile walk. 
we're fortunate to have the perfect path north of the library for the run and a wonderful bike and walk path south of the library for the family, uh, family walk. We suggest you research your routes around town and don't require, that don't require too many street closures and partner up with municipal services and running groups. Um, don't forget about the police, the explorers, uh, college track members, whoever you can. And uh, we reached out to, it was the Chicago Area Runners Association and that's uh, cararuns.org um, for our logistics and connections to timers and um, you know, different things that you need for a marathon. Next slide, please. Keep an ear out for comments and suggestions. Uh, this will inform other events you plan in the future. You note this uh, parent noted that walk and run literally ran at the same time and it worked out for her and her family to participate. So sometimes, sometimes the walks go after a run and uh, sometimes they're together. So it worked out really well that they were together. Next slide, please. So how do these events happen? When library leadership takes a chance on something new, listens to community and staff suggestions, empowers and equips staff and volunteers to network to create new program possibilities in partnership with community. And when libraries are at the table engaged at community planning groups, we can see how literacy is an important component of community health outcomes and libraries belong at these events and sometimes leading these events. And it's, it's more natural than we think. Next slide, please. Walk with the mayor or any walk challenge in your community or county, so check your health department, can step off or end at your library. You can invite walkers in for a library tour, host a water and library resource table, Find a way to add resources to a walk or community health challenge event outside your building. So think about how you can participate. Next slide, please. Create a library walking team for your local or regional walk challenges. Invite staff, volunteers, and the public to join your team. So we have a lot of um, staff walkers and volunteers and people that just come in the library that join our uh, community walk team. We had 24 walkers last summer for the mayor's walk challenge. We still have not gained a lead on the parks and rec team, but we're, we're hanging in there. We're persistent. So uh, your involvement at community tables can lead to organizations actually reaching out to you to host health fairs, bike walk move week events, which is uh, catching on, and health activities for all ages and interests. Next slide, please. We encourage you to think about your community. Um, where are the health and activity educators and programs? Do you have a circus or gymnastics school nearby or in the area? These, this group was from Chicago. Do you have um, a dance group, a Zumba, a bike, or a yoga group? Invite them to share an, an interactive program or maybe you're gonna host a health fair. So you can invite them to do a, a short demo for you. Partnering with police, uh, we do that with our, with our teen uh, studio um, for teen programming. We partner with police for obstacle courses or self-defense programs. So these are some ideas. So just take a look around and see what's a good fit um, and what's uh, plausible. Not every event that you do has to be at your library. We do a lot of events outside our doors. Next slide, please. Simply adding a walk, movement, or even a wiggle to story time can get your community moving. And it's a model to parents that movement and books are not out of step. Dream big, reach out, partner up, and take a leap for walking, running, and movement in or around your library. Next slide, please. These activities take many hands and Andy, Laura and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have. I've also added a, a resource page with many, many contacts, Gail Borden library administrators, librarians, paraprofessionals who can answer specific questions about big picture visions or the detailed implementation of the many walking, biking, running, wellness programs we host. 
Also included are documents and attendee feedback that might help you, um, especially with the Walking Book Club. And I thank our hosts again for inviting us to share our steps with you and thank Emily for her information. Great, uh, thanks Danielle. Um, and so quickly before we go into the question and answer period, I wanna give some closing thoughts. Um, and first, uh, one, one closing thought is that what makes all of the programs that we've heard about today successful with partnerships, um, in fact, I think when we talk about walking program, um, what we should center partnerships and think first about who, who can we work with to make this possible uh, since partnerships are what really make these programs work or not work. Second, when you develop this programming, it's important to frame it in terms of the library's mission to support the whole person and lifelong literacy, and also to highlight how these programs can increase both community wellness as well as staff wellness as you are creating opportunities for your staff to get outdoors and be active. But also make sure that you are thinking about inclusivity. You wanna make sure that whatever routes you choose for your story walk or walking book clubs are accessible to all, including those in wheelchairs. And you may need to adapt some of these ideas uh, to the context of small and rural libraries. For instance, one, I've, one idea I've seen is to have the walking book club coincide with the routes of the bookmobile. They've been doing this in Montana each month when the Lewis and Clark Library's bookmobile makes its scheduled stop at a local park, the walk and talk book club meets to walk around the park and discuss that month's selection. The library sets up the discussion question and provides teas and, snack, teas and snacks um, on a folding table set up adjacent to the bookmobile after the discussion. It's gone really well. Uh, but really the main message I have is to start small and keep going. We've included a ton of information in our handout uh, for, for the session. And so hopefully we've piqued your interest and inspired you to take the first step. Um, and so it may not be a soaring success right out of the gate, but keep trying and you too will succeed. Okay, now it's time for a question and answer. <laughs> Thanks, Noah. Uh, so we have a about 18 minutes for questions and answers, and I see quite a few have already rolled in. Um, so the first one that I've seen a few people ask is, I believe for Emily, um, could you give a rough budget of how much it costs to start a story walk as well as to maintain it? Sure, um, so when we purchase posts and frames for barking, from Barking Dog exhibits, we decided on having 20 posts and frames per park. So um, each park was approximately $3,000 for posts and frames. And then you also want to consider purchasing books and lamination and all of that. So about Four hundred to five hundred dollars to change out a story that's including poster board, glue sticks, three copies of the book to take apart, um, any other <laughs> material. Um, so, like for instance, for our grant, the first year was um, we received about twenty thousand dollars for, and that helped for five parks. And then to maintain it, we're probably spending. $400 per park per quarter. Great. Um, so the next question that we've also had quite a few people asking in the Q&A box is um, if for walking uh, book clubs or programs, if you get any waivers for emergency contacts or have anything that you do for insurance coverage in case someone gets hurt. So each, uh, each, I think organization is different and they have to check with their insurance companies as to what is covered and what's not. When we have programmers come in, uh, and they're doing an activity with our community members in the library. Um, they have to provide a, a, a certificate of insurance for their group. And uh, I believe the Walking Book Club 
is not, uh, I mean, that the walking book club programs are, are covered under our insurance period, but uh, there are no waivers to participate, but I do think that there's some information in the handouts about what uh, was required for the run walk, which is a little bit different. Great. A couple of people are also asking about uh, partnering with uh, Parks and Rec, and um, so this is a two-part question. Um, the first part is, how do you um, make an argument for doing a story walk and partnering with them? And on the flip side, uh, do you recommend getting a written agreement that addresses liability and maintenance? Those are great questions. So um we met early with park and rec as we were filling out the grant to try to think through all of those um those pieces um we basically said that we would pay for all the posts the frames and make sure that we maintain them um but we would need help installing them because they're actually at parks they take care of all the mowing and maintenance around as they normally would maintain the grounds. Um, they have been gracious at the one park where we've asked them to have to go back in and install again. Um, but they've been really gracious. I think the best thing was just that we touched base and brought them into the conversation. We did think we would have to sign a contract for an MOU, but um, none of them ever required that, but it might be a good idea um to at least bring that up and and confirm what each partner will do great um another question that we have is if you've had any walking uh, book clubs that were exclusively for patrons with disabilities uh, we have not we we have had people who were not able to join uh, the book club walking, the walking track would all always come uh, for the end discussion, 45 minute discussion. So um, we haven't had uh, anybody, we haven't had a specific program for that, but everybody's welcome. I, I believe now that we have the walking track inside indoors at the rec center, it makes it a lot more accessible instead of out on the street like we used to. So um, I, I believe everybody's welcome. Great. Um, so another question is, what are the copyright concerns with posting a book for the public to read in a story walk? That's a great question. So you do have to um, purchase copies of the books. You cannot um, use Xerox copies, but once you pay for the book, then you're able to do what you need with it. So we purchased three copies of every book um for a story walk and we actually cut the book apart if we don't make any mistakes then we actually only need two copies but it's nice to have one backup but once you purchase the book and use the original pages from the book you can um, you have the right to do whatever you want with it Great. And then for uh, back to the walking book club program, is there any formal discussion of the book during it? So when you so when you're walking on the track, it's more social uh, in groups that are pacing themselves in different in different uh, capacities. After your walk, you have a room and and you go down and you sit and you talk about the book. Uh, for 45 minutes. So that is a, a much deeper discussion because you're breaking it up into four segments and uh, that's where you talk about the book. Great. And then for people interested in doing a story walk uh, for young adults or children in uh, middle school, do you have any uh, suggestions for adapting that? 
and uh, I could actually take this one, Emily, if Great. that's all right. Uh, so I just put a link uh, in the chat, uh, which is goes to my website. And if you click on fun twists at that website, one of the things that I've highlighted, um, there's two ways that you can adapt story walk for older readers. Um, one is by doing a poetry walk, uh, which are frequently set up more for adults um, or could be set up for middle school. Um, another way that libraries have adapted story walk to older uh, children is to actually feature student artwork uh, in the installations. Um, so they've done that at New York. Um, so really, after you get the story walk installation up, you can put whatever content you have into it. Um, so uh, featuring things like poetry or even student created um, writing would be a way to adapt it to middle school or aged or older, um, older, older individuals. Great, thanks Noah. Um, so we have a few more logistical questions around story walk. Um, the first is how do you combat fading? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I know that our vendor, or the vendor that we use, Barking Dog Exhibits, does sell UV plexis. Um, they cost more, so um, we chose not to purchase those. Um, when talking to the vendor, she felt like they maybe would extend the life of the storyboards without fading for a little while. Um, but basically our goal is to use the story twice. So that's about six months, three months in two different parts. Um, and we do, I mean, that is correct. Um, they do fade due to the sun. It seems like our poster board and everything else around the pages doesn't fade as fast, but um, we usually, we're fortunate if we can get six months out of a story. They do fade. Great. And then the other two logistical questions that we have is how many storyboards per park and what is the distance between them? So it's up to you on storyboards per park. Um, we decided on 20. I know some uh, systems um, use a different amount. They may use 17 or 16. We included 20 and if we have extra frames that we use one for our sponsor page and the survey link page or um, other photos from celebrations. And then again, it's up to you for how far apart you paste the posts and frames. Um, it's generally recommended about 40 paces between each post and frame, about a half a mile for the whole story walk. Um, we actually, I walked together with the park and rep Parks and Rec representative, and we actually walked it out to determine where we were going to put the posts and frames. Um, but it's up to you to actually determine that. But it's recommended 40 paces. And then uh, for the walking book clubs, um, do you have patrons bring along a copy of the book on the walk, or is that mostly just for the discussion afterwards? That's for the discussion afterwards. They can bring their book. There's usually a, uh, lockers at the rec center, or we have locked rooms at the library where we have meeting space. Uh, so people can drop their, their items off. Um, yes, so, so the answer is yes. Bring your books, but don't walk with them. Great. And then um, for the story walks, how do you decide what books to use in your permanent structures? Also, did you keep the to 32 pages uh, since that's the general length of children's books? That's a great question. So originally our team kind of created a list of titles that we thought were visually appealing that worked well for active reading and also fit within the number of posts and frames we had. Um, that was most important. So it, we wanted to make sure the story wasn't too long to fit in there. Um, so yes, generally a 32 page um, picture book works well. Um, and sometimes stories are a little shorter and you have those extra pages. Um, but again, then just books that um, are visually appealing, that was popular to that age range, um, that have nice colorful illustrations. So again, it's personal preference um, as well. Great. 
And then uh, really quick, I'm going to answer the question that we got for a certificate of attending. Um, if you would like a certificate of attendance, email the public programs office at the email that's uh, on your screen on the slide. And then um, another question that we have is, how long are the book club walking programs? So it's, it's weekly, every Wednesday night, 45 minute walk, 45 minute talk. And it's, I believe it starts at uh, 6.30 or seven o'clock. And you know, you're home and in bed by nine. Great. And uh, so it looks like we have one more question in the chat box and someone is just wondering um, how extensive the vandalism is to your story walk uh, boards. So it's just one park. Um, we're going to be working with um, the community and the police department about uh, a way to kind of see if we can combat that. But the main thing is some of the plexis and the other parks get scratched. Um, maybe with a rock or something, but for the most part, we haven't had any trouble. It's just one park, so I feel like it's pretty isolated, um, but the vandalism we have had was significant that we had to replace the post and frame. We're not sure how because it's um, powder coated aluminum, but they have actually cut the, the frame and the post and they can't be welded back. Um, Luckily, it's not too expensive to replace those. So um, I would encourage if you do have grant money or if you're purchasing posts and frames and plexis to actually purchase extra. Um, it's easier to start off with extra. Um, like I have a sash in my office now just in case you need more in the future. Great. Um, so that's it for the questions. In the final four minutes, Noah, Emily, or Danielle, do you have any closing thoughts or um, a word of advice for that you would like to leave for the attendees? Um, I guess I would just like to add, just to reiterate uh, the power of partnerships. Um, I, uh, I know when I talk about this, I frequently get asked a question about budget. Um, and I think uh, the, really the, the response that I always think of is think about your partners uh, and in addition to LSTA funding um, I know um, dozens of libraries that have worked with scouting organizations to get scouts to build story walks for them as part of their Eagle Scout project um, uh, you may find people uh, high school students willing to do it as part of uh, their vocational training so uh, I think the power of partnerships is just uh, just immense and so this is a great opportunity to build partnerships as well by doing doing this type of programming. I agree with Noah. We, we don't do anything at Gail Borden without partnerships uh, and volunteers. We have an amazing community uh, to draw from, from many different organizations and businesses. The city of Elgin has been wonderful. Our university, um, high schools, U, uh, school district U46 is the second uh, largest school district outside of Chicago. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of resources and when we come around and gather over, over a specific vision or idea, we can really do a lot uh, to support the community and, um, of course, literacy. I agree. I think partnerships are so important and also involving um, staff in your organization all the way up to leadership, just making sure they're aware of the initiative and that they can also promote and help with it. Great. Well, a uh, huge thank you to Noah, Emily, and Danielle for this awesome presentation today. And of course, for all of you for uh, joining us, this webinar will be available for viewing on programminglibrarian.org within 48 hours. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.